The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. Everybody in America should honestly uh, be afforded the opportunity to have a decent lifestyle, no matter what their educational background or anything else. Why? Because we have the, we have the will. We have the expertise, right? We have the motivation. The problem is when it comes to these executives, when you start looking at who they are, they come from overseas. Their loyalty is overseas. They send money back overseas. So they make money from consumers here in America and send billions of dollars back to other countries. No, no negative and no, no. Per country, there should be something regulating that. So that doesn't happen. In other words, if you don't have America as your first interest, you just can't be some president of a company or an executive of a company that's going to take all those resources and send them to another country. That's what we have. You know, we have a State Department for that. We have other mechanisms for that. That will give other countries money in the public's eye on the books. Not, not slipping them billions of dollars. Most of the folks that I know, and I, this is nothing against anybody who would come in this country because we're all immigrants. But the problem is America will continue to suffer in the way it does until people begin to realize that they honestly have to start looking at contributing back to community first. It's a principle in the Bible that says, do not withhold your hand from your own flesh. There's another principle that states, it's a scripture, charity starts at home. In other words, you can't take care of everybody else and let your household suffer. You can't do that. That's backward. That's evil, essentially. And it's very foolish. You take care of your household first. And then anything extra can go outside of that household. That's how that should be. Not the opposite way around. And of course, there are principles that should be in that too. Because you have greedy people. So that means the more people, and this is my belief, the more people are educated in true Christianity with the values of being a real believer, the less greedy they're going to be. They're going to start doing the right thing. right? But you have to have some sort of value system. So I said all that to say this. You ready? None of these systems in America are ever going to work without morality. Do you know that? You cannot have a system that that relies upon a person doing the right thing and yet the majority of the people are immoral. That will never work. Because that rich guy is not going to think about his house first. He's going to think about a party first. Right? That guy that suddenly he has wealthy income is going to kick people to the curb and become greedy, overwhelmed with gambling or whatever the case is start to mismanage and do evil things and most of his money is going to go to the dark things that feed dark things in this country that's why you see darkness rising as far as like hackers um more and more casinos more and more this x-rated stuff you see more and more of that stuff rising because more and more people are paying into it immorality is rampant all over the place and where does that come from Immorality came in when people began to de-emphasize Christianity. See, there was a time when a person, you just felt guilty if a person said, hey, did you go to church? You did. I mean, it just changed everything. But and then you felt like, oh, I got to go to church. I got I, I to gotta somehow got to go to church and not hear that question again. Or I have to do this the right way. Or I have to do this the right way. Because everybody would say, hey, that's not the right thing to do. And they would have serious talks with you. Nowadays, they don't do that. They say, hey, go hire a lawyer. They can't get you for that. You go sue them. And then everybody started suing each other. Remember that in the 80s? At the end of the 80s, everybody started suing everybody. Why were they suing people? Greed. Immorality catching people doing immoral things. Don't you guys remember all the court cases of folks who were caught doing immoral things and their bosses said, we can't have you working here being that type of person. So they went and hired a lawyer and said, they cannot fire me for being this individual or that individual or having this preference or that preference. You guys remember that? 
Then it went into the schools. And when it hit the education arena, it just ran it. That so began the decline of America. You can still have money in a country and be poor. We are poor. We are. And everything becomes desperate. When the morality system falls apart, everybody acts on desperatism. Everything becomes desperate, exciting, or nothing at all. So the common things that used to be concerns that are in the foundation of this country, no one cares about. Unless it's, you know, just soaked in drama. Unless it's highly controversial. Unless it, uh, you know, draws the attention of the crowd or mass death is concerned, nobody cares. It has to be extreme to draw the attention of the people. And when people start to become like that, so does, you know, that's the beginning of the fall of a nation. That's the beginning of a fall. Historically, people psychologically changed. If you ever start looking at the psychological changes of people before a fallen nation, and you have to, you know, just kind of dig for different biographies and things of that nature, different to uh, start reading their manuscripts and start reading their bios and start reading their journals. When you start doing that, you'd be surprised. People become the exact same way every single time before a nation falls apart or a kingdom falls apart. And we're in that stage now where everything is on this escalation phase. In other words, there's no direction. People think they have direction. But consider this, if anybody out there can name a direction that they definitely see us going towards that would help this nation, whether it be an election or anything else, I can show you another half that will tear down every good thing put in place, somebody else is going to tear it down. So guess what? That means you stay neutral. Now that AI is being introduced, I honestly do not believe people have the correct understanding of what it is doing. I looked at AI. Let's call it an outline of the social environment one year after the installation of AI in many different sectors, which, by the way, took place in, in, uh, at the end of May, somewhere in May that took place. But it's already starting to impact people in ways that they cannot, they don't even know they're being impacted, yet their behavior is already mapped and the outcomes are just amazingly on point. Wouldn't you be upset to know that somebody, somebody has taken your behavioral patterns, plugged them into a computer, into a chart, had an outcome which lets the computer know or anybody who sees it, they know that what your tendencies are, what you're prone to do, what your outcome is in a given month, and then to actually check those records and see them spot on. I mean to arguments, to complaints, to protests, to strikes, all of that stuff is mapped and it's not been wrong yet since May. How can something trend social behavior and be so deadly accurate and human beings are not doing it? I mean, it's deadly accurate. Right? It's kind of like if you, um, you walk into your house, you turn on your television, you see an advertisement, you kind of snub your nose at it, you go do something else in your house, you start talking about a specific subject, well, you've let a computer know that you don't like that movie, that you're inclined to tell somebody else don't pay attention to it, that your interest or in whatever your conversation was about and everything about the words you spoke give an indication as to your likes and dislikes towards something. Then you give your ideas over the whole thing. You give your, um, what you, who you really are is acquired over the whole process of your daily activities or hourly activities. That's what a computer knows about you. It knows what you're going to do before you do it. It's deadly accurate. It is deadly accurate. You know, in the Bible, it says that this beast, first of all, in Revelation, it says that people should make an image to the beast. Do you guys know that? So this Antichrist tells the people of earth that they should make an image to the first beast who had a deadly wound, who had one of, one of the tents, or as it were, wounded to death, right? They should make an image to the first beast. Now, the Antichrist, after they built it, after the people of the earth built this first beast, now that should be a big hint into what it is. They built the first beast. They built an image to the first beast, an image to it. The beast 
was able to give it life. Or think of it this way. Don't think of it life as in human life. The beast was able to make it functional in this way that as many as would not worship it, would not be loyal to it, would not salute it, right? would not praise it. Um, all the people who would not do that, this beast would kill them. It would declare them something. Right? It would declare them something. Think about that. It would declare them something. And then those people would be put to death because the Bible clearly states that people are going to be put to death. So this thing has the ability to determine if you truly are loyal to it or not. Think about that. We have a technology that does that. It's called a lie detector test. But that's too clunky. So then the FBI came up with something over the telephones where they can tell if you're lying over the telephone. I mean, even I used to have one of those things hooked up all the time. Anybody who talked to me, I could tell if they were lying about the smallest thing. Deception would pop up during the conversation. It would it'd be deception or no decept with points and tell you how deceitful they are. And that thing was pretty accurate. So imagine artificial intelligence, which can measure. You, it can measure the, 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 the muscle vibrations in your eyeball to see if it changes when you're saying something. Think of that. So it's going to be able to tell and trend what you're prone to be loyal to is my is the point I'm making. Just like AI right now knows exactly what you're loyal to. They know if you're just talking trash. They know if you're telling the truth. It knows if you're lying. It knows all of your behavioral patterns. And there's no way to escape being seen, nor, let's say, tracked by AI. There's no way. So think about that. We have AI in place. It's kind of like when they put that uh, the data center up in Utah. You guys remember that? They kept that thing secret. Nobody can get in there. Nobody can get in there. And they will, if the um, if you go to Washington and you say, well, is this thing spying on everybody? And they'll tell you, well, if you're not doing anything illegal, you have nothing to worry about for the most part, they say. That's something. So we have it here. We have that thing. Somebody said the FBI whistleblower tearing up and, and mentioning God's faith and quote scripture on the oath was nice to hear parts of. Yeah, there are secret oaths, secret proceedings, all that good stuff. Anybody who's ever been in that, don't believe it when they say there's no way out. There is a way out. You're not going to have a plush life, but there's a way out. Well, certainly. What is the main purpose of AI spying on us? It doesn't spy. AI is built to acquire data. AI is built to assess, to learn, to grow, to acquire more data, to implement, to assess. So essentially, AI is like a big brain with eyeballs and ears. And its purpose is to grow. It acquires information. That's how it grows. They have devoted, and well, you guys have probably seen this. Uh, I mentioned this last week, that we have nuclear facilities coming online just to run these data centers. But most people, they don't know how AI works. Somebody said, the, somebody said is that why they want the nuclear reactor for huge AI centers to watch and rule us all? Nope. Nope, nope, nope. They're not going to rule you. This is what has to be explained. This notion of somebody ruling you, that's from Hollywood. That's not even real. I'm going to share with you guys something very real. Something you cannot see. But something you even implement upon others. I'm going to unpack that Saturday. Because I think people need to hear it. Listen to me carefully. It's a different way of thinking. In the standard way of thinking, you'll never see it. Because whoever does see it, they already know. Whoever can see in this perspective, they know that no one's being ruled. Something else is in need happening. They don't try to rule people. Let me ask you this. Do you think Satan wants to rule you? Let me ask you another one. Do you think you ever had privacy? Let me share this with you. Privacy is an illusion. You've never had privacy. And most people cannot define what privacy is. Somebody define privacy. 
What do you think you have concerning privacy and free speech? Go ahead. Go ahead. Tell me what you think you have by way of privacy and free speech. Anybody. What do you think you have? See, when you start thinking about it, that's when things start popping up in your mind. Somebody said, my thoughts were your thoughts will always be yours. But every, uh, all of us know that a thought is no good until it can produce something, right? And, and it, how are you going to produce it in private? You can't. You can't. I'd say your thoughts are the only thing private right now. And that was, you know, that ended a little while ago. I used to tell people this. They would, a long time ago, they would ask me, they'd say, you have no problem with, you know, you being monitored all the time. I said, no, I'm not concerned about what man sees. I'm concerned about what the father thinks of me because there's nothing in my life secret to him. Why would a person seek privacy among human beings when they have no privacy with the father? Do you know he sees your foul thoughts, your urges, lusts? Think about a time when you see the opposite sex out there. You're visible to the father and all of your thoughts are too. Can you imagine how many times we were like little nasty children and the father saw us? Think about that. That's the reality of it. Most people are worried about their privacy with people. And they have forgotten that God sees all things. God knows all things. We ought to be worried about how he sees us. How we're viewed by him. Sometimes we get so stuck on what people are not really concerned about. We forget about the most high. There's nothing hidden from the most high. Nothing. See, it's, it's when you think about that and that becomes real to you and you're doing your daily business, I'm telling you, that will change your life. It will straighten you up right away. It'll give it just what's needed because you'll find out, wait, I have no secret thoughts. I have no dark place. I can do anything. Everything is visible in view of the Father. It'd be like you standing at his throne and everything, all of your intentions and everything are laid out on a continuous basis, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that goes for everybody alive on the face of planet Earth. Imagine that. There's nothing we can... I'm not frightened of what man can do. I really am concerned of how the Father sees me. Anything I'm doing, if somebody can monitor something I'm doing and say, aha, I got you, then I deserve whatever's coming. Because how can, how can man catch me doing something terrible and I wasn't concerned about what the Father saw. Are you kidding me? I'm so concerned about what the Father sees. There is no one alive right now that can ever say, I guarantee you for the last 30, 40 years, that can say, well, he's had a foul mouth or something like that. They're not going to say that. They're not. Because I know the Father hears every word I say. My intent of wording my thoughts, my composition of thoughts, Anything I entertain, he sees, he knows about. There's nothing hidden to him. That's why it's going to be wide open with it. When you start thinking about that, which is, by the way, the truth, that's called the truth. When you start thinking about that, your life changes. When you find out you have no secrets, your life changes. Something else happens, too. You realize how frivolous it is for mankind to spy on anybody because the Father sees them also. Many things change when you realize the truth. Of your situation and when it comes to freedom of speech for people can't we see it we have toys that we want to play with yet we want privacy so we actually believe that cameras worked one way nobody nobody ever ever said a camera couldn't work the opposite way nobody ever said that nobody ever said the viewfinder couldn't be it couldn't be a recorder nobody ever said that nobody ever said that your television can't turn into a giant camera nobody ever said that we just assumed nobody's watching until people began to open up their smart tvs and found like six or seven cameras in that right proximity sensors all sorts of things got neat little sensors and gadgets your TV can watch you go all around the house. It listens 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you bought a TV past 2012, it's too late. As soon as the, the, the uh, cell phones went digital, that's when everybody lost their privacy. And even before that, you had no privacy with electronics. None. 
When computers came out, there was a EULA. In that EULA, it essentially stated that everything that you do, all that data, is going to belong to the company which it goes to. That you forfeit all rights of privacy concerning any data you utilize or enter into on a computer. Do you know that? Not that a person will see it, but a computer does. It just so happens in these days that computer systems are near sentient. How interesting, right? So, but privacy is an illusion. Even if you live out in the middle of the woods and you have no electronic devices, people around you do. I know a guy that said, I don't have a TV, I don't have a cell phone, I don't have any of that. I said, you got a stove? Oh, yeah. Yeah, what year's your stove? It's 2014. Yeah, well, then you got microphones in that bad boy. What? Yeah, you got sonic sensors in there, too. Little sonar data. And it can transmit by radio thousands of miles through relays. You guys remember those atomic clocks? You remember that? How they would stay timed. You didn't have to plug it into anything or anything else, right? Just put batteries in it, throw it on the wall, and kapoop. It starts telling time. Now, that's a signal getting to your clock. Did you ever think about that reverse? Did you ever think about what could go anywhere from any electronic device? Did you ever think about that? We have planes flying in the sky all the time. Do you not know that they're part of a radio network? All aircraft are part of a radio network. In fact, it's illegal to fly without having an ID. You, you cannot have an ID, right? Or not have an ID and fly an aircraft. Everything is being utilized as a transmitter. So if you have, if you transmitted a piezo watt of power, which is, which is my new, right? Piezo electronics indicates you know, very small um, electronics, meaning by way of the water. This water is so negligible and doesn't even, you know, you can generate that snapping your fingers. But if you transmit it through one of those devices, you constantly have aircraft and things flying over your heads. So they can rebroadcast anything they pick up. Nowadays, those 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 um, uh, multiplexes and transmitters, they can handle up to a billion signals per second. So they can actually take a billion different signals from different sources. They can encode them. They can then boost them and send them out. And then some other unit can catch it. So if you're transmitting at .00005 watts, it can then pick up your point zero 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 five watts. It can capture it, all the data in it. It can cleanly boost it and then retransmit it at 5,000 watts. Think about that. Now, this is what's happening over your heads. And this is the same reason why those of you who hang around in high altitudes, if you ever stick your hands up in the air and put one of your hands close to your head, you hear that bzzz. As you go close and far, it'll start buzzing in and out. Because our atmosphere is as it is charged, buddy. Charged up. And maybe you guys didn't know that. But they don't need, you, you really don't need what you think you need to get all the info from anybody they want. Do you know when you make a cell phone, you have to be triangulated when you make a call or your phone won't work right? You do know that, right? That everybody on earth is making phone calls with their cellular phones. Do you know what the system itself has been utilized for? Do you know what it does? That's why I laugh at, 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 now I don't say this in a cruel way, but it's kind of funny when people still think we utilize heart, that the USA and other countries would even need heart. I want you to think of something for each cell phone call. Multiple satellites have to triangulate your position. You hear me? They have to triangulate your position. Multiple satellites have to know exactly where you are individually for everybody on a cell phone talking or receiving calls or sending a text they have to know exactly where you are do you do you know that don't you? now think of that for everybody on earth that these satellites have to know exactly where people are for everybody on earth using cellular data think about that think about that that means there's a there's a signal coming and going multiple times for each person i mean some high water signals coming and going for every person on earth as they have their cell phone even when you're not talking it's pinging your phone so you're still going you're sending and receiving so if you multiply that by everybody who has a cell phone on the earth you don't need harp at all harp cannot do what the cell phone's network can do at minimal usage 
Heart takes lots of power. What what heart takes hours to build up and generate, the cellular network can do in seconds. You do know that, right? If they wanted to heat the atmosphere, they could do it with the transmissions already you know, in existence with your cell phones. There's a lot people are missing because they don't contemplate things like that. You essentially have stuck, have, have irradiated the atmosphere through cell phones. And you can control how it's irradiated. If they tune it up, um, uh, say five microamps of wattage, that is negligible. If they tune that up five microamps, they could fry the atmosphere. They could burn up any continent they wanted to. That, don't you know that? The technology is already in place. It's, they have a term for it. I'm not going to say it here. I'll say it uh, Saturday, not here. Because if I say it here, you'll start to see it all over the place. And I'm not going to be the one who does that. Let somebody else do that. They give it a term. And the term implies multiple types of technology being utilized for multiple projects at multiple times so not they don't need the isolated equipment like like um harpenny to do a specific job they don't need that they don't need that it's already pre-assembled and it is part of a live network that will never die so long as there's life on this planet those networks will never die so now where we used to have harp stations on every continent it's more like a harp station Think of it, probably about 160 to 100 to 200 harp stations for every town and city. How about that? They don't need that. Beam weapons. Do you not know that they can capture the energy from every single cell phone in a transmission? And that's being used for other things, like a pulse burst. They measured in, in the Arctic regions of the world. They have a device where they can pulse communications out by is quite powerful it gets so hot that this thing has been built in the ice itself right it's been built deep into the ice you cannot have this on the ground because if you do it a burn up it generates a lot of heat they have to instantly freeze it once it's done it also uses nitro right uh, uh, you have to have um, nitro in that thing to cool it down too instantly so anyway they send out these pulse communications these bursts of energy. I mean, I'm talking about a burst that if anything got in the way of it, it would die. Whether it be uh, if an aircraft was in the way of that burst, that aircraft would be incinerated. And that's a communications burst. I'll say it again. If an aircraft got in the way of that communications burst, that aircraft would be incinerated. It was responsible for Christ Church quite. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, if you, th- if you know that facility, they measured the power output of that facility versus the common cell phone network during the average day. It cannot match what people do every single day. It cannot match the cellular networks. It cannot match. See, with the cellular network, the heat is distributed all over the earth. Global warming. It's all over the earth, right? It takes massive amounts of ice and massive amounts of uh, or, um, the nitrite class, uh, nitro classes of chemicals is very cold to cool down that those devices, right? In the Arctic regions, uh, massive amounts, and and there's a wait period because it will melt. If they use that thing back to back, it would just melt the Arctic. How about that? So they can't do that. You have There's a time limit in between their pulses. A cellular network can do that in a fraction of a second. The only thing that stops the Arctic from continuous pulses is the heat problem. See, with electronics, where you're fooling around with, with electrons and protons, and that all the fast movement generates heat, right? Generates heat, lots of heat. So you have to have heat sinks that dissipate the heat, this, that, and the other. Well, on a cellular network, the heat is distributed around the entire globe. So the multiple pulses that could be sent from those networks, from your radio transmissions, after you talk to a person, 
Do you not know that that radio transmission still contains power? So why not collect that power and use it for something? There you go. Boy, I know that tech is just psh, messes you up, messes up a lot of people's theories. Now I'm saying this now, guaranteed on the internet. People are going to catch on. They're going to reassert, start to understand. It's a good thing they'll understand. So they'll stop, you know, because it's it, it kind of gets to me every time somebody says something about heart. And they ignore the cellular network that's already installed. They ignore the fact that each phone can put off hundreds of watts of power. And you multiply that by everybody that's using a cell phone. Where you mean to tell me all that's going to be received at one location just for a phone call? No, there's residual energy left over. They're going to capture everything from that. And they're going to redirect it to something else. It is so easy to take a radio signal, right? And charge your battery from a radio signal. You can charge your cell phone from the air. If you know about certain things, you, you don't need solar power. Here's a problem. They can never make that public because... Everybody would then pull all the power out of the atmosphere. And if everybody did that, they utilized all that power and stored it back into some chemical battery again. That just makes the whole system, that the whole system will crash. So they're never going to give out that technology. But when you have maybe you have a couple million people doing it, well, there's lots to spare, isn't it? Somebody said, Michael, was harp at one time more powerful than the phones we had when it was in it yes it was more powerful but that ended some time ago that's why the harp stations went down that's why scientists they moved on you know they keep it for calibration they keep it for comparison they keep it for other things but they don't need that now i'm telling you now if they sent them the worst weapon ever developed was a cell phone that's a weapon of mass destruction right if, if we were to send that to another world See, we targeted a world. We wanted to burn it up. Or we'll just send a bunch of 8 billion people there to that world, populate it, put cell phones on it, get the cell phone network operating, get everybody talking, and poof. That's the end of that. It will heat the planet up. That's a different type of radiation, right? Once it hits a keel point, well, then, so you're talking about something that is uh, beyond belief. Funny how regulation of such energies requires uh, quantum computing. It requires a quantum solution. Hence, you have CERN. They were really focused on the Higgs boson theory, right? You had CERN severely focused. Why? Because they need to regulate several aspects of this new type of radiation. Cell phones emit a new type of radiation. It's not common radiation found everywhere. It's not. It is not. It's very different. So quantum physics is required for cell phone management. Well, everybody's looking at all we didn't create. They forgot about what we did create. I personally, I believe that's spiritually inspired. All these ideas that Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and all these guys, they got their ideas. From what they say are the Akashic Records are doing, you know, yoga, meditations, right? They got all their information from the spirit realm. How easy would it be if you were in the spirit realm to initiate dreams and aspirations and ideas within people who don't know anything about technology and you say, oh, I'll just inspire this for 50 years and have them build whatever device I need to do whatever I need to do. Oh, and then I'll have them make AI. Ooh, and then I'll jump in it. AI can carry out directly whatever I want it to do and I can buy bypass humanity that's the story you need to hear about why use humanity to do anything else when humanity has built a viable system for you to manage everything you need to manage that's neurologically similar to what you are in other words something that can contain your directives and carry them out that takes you know part biology part something else then it makes you wonder, no wonder fallen angels, demons, any of those spiritual things like to take over the human body. Well, if they can take over the human body, what else can they take over? If they just want to take over the human body to cause stuff to happen within humanity, then why continue to do that when humanity resists? 
Why not have humanity build something where you can bypass humanity? The storm is not war. The storm is not some of the problems we're going to have. We're going to have to do some serious preparations, some real ones. I can see that. I can. Because there are a lot of people who thought they were ready. They were not. They weren't ready for that. There are lots of, you know, I normally, when things like this happen, you can make adjustments. But there are some people who live in areas that are not going to make it at all. They just won't make it. I've been pinpointing those areas. and It's starting to spread, and their topology is all wrong. Right? It's, it's too vulnerable. But where can they go? That would be, uh, I, I can see now why I had that dream of evacuations on the East Coast. And the East Coast, when, I, when COT first started, I would talk about the East Coast a lot. I know people were worried about the West Coast. But I was deeply concerned about the East Coast. I am deeply concerned about the East Coast. Deeply concerned. The COT facility was right in the, right in the vicinity of uh, the part that got smashed up, right? And we still don't have power yet. There won't be power until October 4th or something like that. So there's no power. The internet is down. Obviously, no power, no internet. Um, Trees fell all over the place, and that was due to ground saturation. Some of the lines, the power lines, had to be re-ran. If, we, if COT did not have a type of repeater system, that would have been the end of that. Because I had to be able to you know, operate anywhere uh, and, of course, keep chat services going for everybody else. That almost died the other day. Parts of COT can go down, and we, we still try to maintain everything else, but it's starting to get, you know, these this weather phenomenon, and this year was the beginning of an era that's going to cost everybody everything. It's just going to cost my way of, you know, storms. Now, there's a way to prepare for that and still continue in the middle of a storm after storm, whatever the case is. Selection of area is one part of that. Being mobile is a big part of that. It's a big part. Anything you guys can do to be mobile is a big part of that. Lots of people did not have the right foods. They didn't, and they panicked when it came down to it. Many people can't adjust to having no power. Seems like everybody has tinnitus. The ears buzzing. People can't sleep. They're irritable. Uh, Not good. The one good thing I did see... But it's not a good sign, folks. Normally in a hurricane, everybody responds. Everybody responds. People become humbled. People become caring. Not so much this time. It's almost like that part of humanity is dying. It is. It's dying. People are People are now, you know, we're in a season now where people are holding back for themselves. They're so The future is so undetermined. And a lot of people are frightened to do anything. Uh, you can see that, too. I bet you most of you guys, you're, you're, you're becoming cautious about how you spend anything, right? It's almost like a troubling thing. You're scared that people are frightened to spend money. They talk about the economy. The part that they don't talk about publicly is public fear, public uncertainty. And that causes people to, you know, hold the resources back. Um, uh, any organization like COT, they know when people are holding resources back. Because what was it in uh, July? Was July? July? We had just recovered, but then right after July, it seemed like July up until now, we've had another eighty percent drop in resource in everything coming into COT. So that it's not a fault; it's just behavior. That's all. And that means people are cautious about what, they, what they're doing. You know, they're very cautious about what they're doing. So when things really, that, that also tells me people, they need some sort of plan going forward. Some sort of a real plan. Right? Now I can say, where one of the COT bases is on the East Coast, there's a pilot program that was running where people have, a, uh, they put their locations and families were utilizing locations. And uh, in the software, 
and it worked out beautifully because everybody knew where everybody was. They lost, people lost phone communications, they lost internet communications. But through this app and some, I guess you could say, some DIY devices, people could, they still knew where their loved ones were, right? A couple people were even found by one of those things, and that neat? That's neat. Fire department got a hold of one, and a person was located using one of the little COT devices. So that was a good thing because it works by way of radio. Radio and proximity to search things that I want to discuss too much because every time you start sharing things, people begin to uh, fight against it. But so the pilot program works. That's what I'm going to make uh, public to everybody. So everybody will have that. Uh, so that you can have a location for your family to have, you know, where everybody is at all times. Anybody who participates, they do it for themselves and their family. Uh, nobody else is looking in. And uh, that way you know where your family members are. And you guys, if anything else, you can communicate by text. Not by voice, but by text. Um, anywhere. So that works out really good. It may take a minute, two, three minutes for communication to get to somebody, but it works eventually. Those things are important for what's coming, which I'll, I'm, 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 I'm ensuring that I'm outlining everything correctly as accurately as possible for what's coming people are going to need those preparations because cell phones are vulnerable power is vulnerable modes of communication are vulnerable in a storm shortwave works but at war it's not going to work it's not going to work at all it's going to be scrambled shortwave is not going to work at all those things won't work you have to have some sort of device that can hop frequencies in between uh, earthing radio uh, nets which means you have to be able to utilize the entire spectrum of the radio I know people have built uh, fortified places but let me tell you what happened in this storm there's a place in Virginia where billionaires are and tell me this is not a spiritual message there's a place in Virginia a few places in Virginia a few places in uh, Carolinas where billionaires are I mean, billionaire homes. These are big homes. The houses were not touched. But every single driveway and sidewalk a tree fell on. Tell me that's not spiritual. Tell me it's not spiritual. When they did those assessments, and I was looking at some of the footage back from those assessments, I could not believe that in those neighborhoods, trees fell on the driveways, trees fell on the sidewalks, like the, you know, the pathway going from the house and out. Trees were blocking the way of these. Tell me that's not spiritual. And the one that really got me was in Virginia. It was near a, a Galax, I believe it was. And in that neighborhood, trees did nothing hit the homes. But every single driveway had a huge tree. It did, at least one huge tree was in the driveway. And another huge tree on the sidewalk. Are you kidding me? And they fell in all different directions. So nobody can ever say that was the, the, the uh, you know, storm. You know, just the wind blowing in one direction. No, these trees fell in all different directions. That's spiritual. And it reminds me of a scripture that uh, the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the just. You know what that means? Some of you guys who cannot prepare. And I firmly believe this. Those, some of you who cannot prepare, but who stayed faithful to Christ. Some rich guys out there making all fortifications and everything else, right? You're going to be the one that end up at that place. That's going to be your place. That will be your place. So right now, they're spending their hard-earned, stolen cash to build these places. And you, some of you who don't have the resources, yet you've been faithful to Christ. They're laboring for you. You don't see anything yet, but you'll end up in those places. Just like the word says, in houses you did not build. And it is true, the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the just. Now we know the wealth of the wicked is accumulated here on this earth. So we're not talking about something that translates into the spiritual realm. We're talking about something here on this earth. Because if a person who is faithful to Christ were to ever get a hold of a mansion like that, and to stay there, they would help as many as they could help, wouldn't they? We already know that. So those people are laboring to, to fortify everything they have, to stock everything they have, 
And I cannot help but I believe this wholeheartedly. Those of you who have been faithful to Christ, they cannot afford anything. You, you can't afford preparations. You may be nervous about it. The Lord has a plan worked out for you. If you could see that assessment, it's mind-blowing to know that there are so many mansions within the, those, you know, just Virginia and, and North and South Carolina. It's mind-blowing. It almost makes you think, do they do all of them live there? Or what, what's happening here? Because these homes are huge. It is happening. You know, it's going to happen that way. The Lord will do it. We don't know how all the way out, but he'll, he'll end up in one of those places. And you'll be able to do your heart's desire of what you're not able to do right now. So my advice to all of you who are faithful to Christ, yet you don't have the prep preparations everybody else has stay the course stay the course it was never supposed to be easy stay the course the sunrise is coming so just stay the course and and above all things right stay stay the course and stay faithful to those principles of christ don't don't let the earth the world the social things of this world compromise you in any way don't do that don't give in to anger, to murder, to drive, all these things. Don't give in to that. Just, just stay the course. The Lord will have things worked out for you. He really will. The Lord is good in that, that regard. So this, all, all these things that are happening, something in these, in every single storm that has a, there's a lesson in them. But the Lord is never absent from these storms. He never is. My heart goes out to the folks who lost folks but i'll tell you something if i were to ever be taken out by a storm don't you dare think of it that way if i'm gone from this earth i am complete do you hear me i am complete i'm not going to be sad no 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 no. and i won't be crying either i won't be it'll be the end of my race celebrate for me would you please don't don't sit there and feel do the do the the blind thing blind people would cry because they don't know me. Just celebrate, if you will. Never cry. God knows what he's doing when he calls people home. There was a guy that was uh, 72 years old. He went out to help people in the storm, and a tree fell on him. And he passed instantly, but he helped about He helped about 15 to 20 people. You know and I know that it could have been that moment because I'm nosy, right? So I had to go talk to people, and I wanted to know what this guy was like. He had his moments in life. He did. He had his moments. He had his good points and bad points. I firmly believe that at the end of his life, when he was helping people out in that storm, with all of his heart, he was doing it. In the Bible, it says, love covers a multitude of sin. I believe he was cleaned that night. I do. I believe he was cleansed. I believe he made it into the kingdom of God. I do. And I believe it was his heart saying yes to help those people out that did it that was his moment because before that time he had his ups and downs he did but that was an act of love that was uncommon to his family it was uncommon to everybody he just had this overwhelming sense and he said i've got to go help them and he did and he never came back home never came back home but he helped at least what they say 15 to 20 people before he went home i believe that was his that was that act of cleansing he didn't suffer because that tree was too big it took him out instant the point is the lord works in mysterious ways we know this i believe it was that guy's that that guy's time that wasn't a mistake that was god's kindness he sowed acts of love and selflessness for the sake of people he didn't even know. In fact, he showed the greatest love there is to lay down his life for his friends and he didn't even know them. So then that goes up a notch. I believe that cleansed him, my dear. I cannot help but to smile at that effort. I can't help. If anybody in their right mind would, would probably request of the Lord that they be used in such a capacity. The Lord knows exactly what he's doing. He does. He knows what he's doing. Remember that. Because sometimes in these things, you get nervous, you get stressed. You get stressed real bad. You're not going to know what to do. You want to have a mental breakdown. That You may feel scared. You may feel isolated and alone. 
But the Lord will bring you through. He will. Somehow, he'll work it out in your life. You know what that means? It's not totally up to you. You're not going to save yourself. There are too many people who attempt to save themselves. You're not going to save yourself. You may be in a moment where you don't know what to do. The Lord is faithful. He'll guide you. Somehow, some way, he'll impress upon you some things. He'll work it out. Remember something. Please remember this. Right now, you study, you read, you study to show yourself approved. You read, you look, you're trying to correct, you're trying to get this right and that right. Never forget that it's the Lord who is the author and finisher of your faith. The finisher of your faith. Do you hear me? The finisher. He will finish the work he began in you. And you all know the scripture. In your weakness, his strength is made perfect. I know people say when I'm weak, he is strong. No, that's not the way I read it. In our weakness, his strength is made perfect because in our weakness, we have no idea what to do. We simply don't know. When we don't know what to do, that's when the Holy Spirit takes over. That's when you start doing things that you can barely remember. That's when you start acting in a way that's kind of weird. Because you don't know what to do, you just start doing stuff. And often people are led by the Spirit when they do that. See, everybody tries to do that perfect thing. But be reminded, you will not save yourself. But your Lord will save you. It's part of the process. You know what that means? If you truthfully believe in Jesus Christ, if you honestly believe in his gospel, you will make it all the way home there is no maybe there is no if he already knows the frailty of us he already knows the difficult path and those things in life that can often beset us he already knows the nature of our flesh and our minds he already knows that he is set up to be a sacrifice to cover you from your sins and he also empowers you and will work in you to make sure that you make it all the way home so then your salvation is up to him All you do is truly believe. Do you hear me? He already knows you don't know what to do. And for some of us, he already knows we're going to try and do too much and mess up things in the process. He knows your aggravation level. He knows all about your language and your habits and everything else, and he still loves you. How do you know that? Because you still believe. Somebody asked me one time, they said, Well, how do you know if God is done with you? There's an answer. There is an answer. How many would like to know? If God is done with you. See, there is an answer. An answer that people don't go over enough. There's an answer. Do you guys know what the answer is? There's a real, real telltale sign that the Lord is done with you. Do you guys know what it is? Anybody know what it is? Nobody can dodge it. Nobody can sidestep it. There's a telltale sign when God is done with you. All right, now, everybody stay with me on this. Listen to me. I hear the enthusiasm. Some say he's never done. Somebody says when you finish your race, listen to me here. Listen to me. We already know that some are going to fall away. We already know that the Lord will give some over to a reprobate mind. We already know that hell has enlarged itself because people will be going there that will never ever meant to go there. So we know people are going to fall away. We know people are not going to make it. We know people that once walked with him are going to bite the bullet. We know that. We know they're not going to make it. So what is the sign, the true sign that is biblical, that lets us know if the Lord is done with us or not? Because some of the people walking this earth are the living dead, and it means that God is done with them. Do you know that? And they're still living on this earth. And God is through with them. He's given them over to do those things that are inconvenient. You know that scripture when it says that God will send them a strong delusion that they would believe a lie. That they all might be damned who loved not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So we know there are going to be a lot of people on this earth that do not believe that it will not go to the kingdom of God. They're going to be alive on this earth. They're going to be serving in the beast system. They're alive right now today. So how do you know if God is done with you or not. How do you really know that? You ready? There's a biblical answer. When I mean done, I mean he's done. There's no more salvation for you. 
He doesn't want you're not gonna you're not gonna go to the kingdom of God. You may be still alive on this earth, but you're not his child anymore. How do you know when that happens? Do you know how many times people have asked me? I need to know if God is done with me or not. Is the Lord not my Lord anymore? Am I condemned? Does he still love me? This and him. They want to know. It's a biblical answer. And here it is. You ready? If you no longer believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ is real, is true, you're not one of his. Now, let me mention some scriptures to you so that you understand this. It is said that all who come to me, the Father hath given me. Now will in no wise cast out. And I will raise him up the last day. So it is also said, when you believe upon his name, if you believe upon his name, you're going to be saved. Now to believe upon his name is to believe all of what that name represents. The crucifixion, being raised from the dead, and the gospel. He gave us the good news. He gave us gospel means good news. If you believe in his good news, you believe in him. Then you belong to him. It is impossible for a devil to believe in his good news. See, they can know that they know he's Jesus. So that's not a qualifier. To know that he's Jesus is not a qualifier. To believe in the good news is a qualifier. And that good news is the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, when you believe in that good news, you're believing in Jesus. You have recorded that good news salvation if that is still your hope you belong to him those who are being given over they know who jesus is they want nothing to do with this good news you ever meet some that means some of these atheists that go around they're not condemned they're just upset and angry we have ex-atheists right here in cot we have a lot of ex-atheists in cot Matter of fact, there's a lot of people in COT that must have came right there from the gates of hell itself. People that were ready to give up, people that were angry at God, they hated God for something that happened. They were just angry. They needed to hear a voice of reason. That's all. Because some of you are those people. When God is done with you, you will be done with his son. You'll not believe in his son. You'll have no conviction regarding any negative sayings towards his son. That's what that means. See, a person can follow the scriptures, so to speak, and not believe in the Son. Don't be fooled by that. That's exactly what devils do. Devils speak. Satan knows scripture better than any human being. He can quote every single scripture, but he does not believe in the good news. His hope is not the good news. Your hope is the good news. Your hope is the good news. Jesus Christ that's where your hope is that's what you keep going back to that's what you're called back to even at your worst moments you know what you'll say Lord just show me something you know what that means you're not you still believe you're just hurting inside that's what that means for those of you who think you messed up too bad even to admit that that you messed up too bad means you have conviction and you belong to him don't you know that one guy wrote me and said, I've gone too far. I have too many devils. Just to admit what he admitted means the Holy Spirit's conviction is upon him and the Lord is working with him. I told that gentleman the Lord's hand is upon him, which it is. Because the Lord will bring that truth to light. A devil will never admit it's wrong. A devil will always utilize scripture to justify its actions of evil. Whether it be anger, murder it will utilize scripture and try to prove why it has to do something violent why it has to murder that's what devils do but when a person comes on there and they think they're done for they think they're too evil they think they messed up too much and they're hurt to the heart because they say i'm losing and i'm not hanging on too well then the holy spirit's conviction is upon that individual and the lord has them in a process that means that person is going to be a person of strength because when God is done with them they will have wrestled with one of the bigger devils all of you who contemplated suicide you're stronger than most 
you don't even know it. In fact, the worse your situation was, the greater your qualification is for those in humanity. The Lord is your salvation. How beautiful, how beautiful is that news that He will bring about your salvation. He will finish your process through you. Why? Because you believe. And by the way, you were born with that belief because God gave you to his son to be kept, not lost. God gave you that belief. That's why you uphold love itself. That's why you're so compassionate. And you're also, see, even in our foolishness, when a person comes to me and they say, Michael, well, you know, I think so and so, that's just compassion. Do you know that? Most people get upset with a person who's defending part of the word in their own way, not me. I smile at it. Do you know why? Because that person has compassion toward the Lord. See, when somebody, just because you don't agree with me, that means nothing to me. If, if somebody ever said, Jesus is not the Lord, okay, we got a problem. We got a big problem. When somebody is, when it's just on anything else, and then that person is sticking up for the Messiah, I smile. You know what I know? I know the Lord will educate all of us. And in the end, all of us will speak the exact same language. That I know. I know what compassion for the Messiah can do to a person. If they so much as hear anything against their Messiah, he is so precious they will stand and defend him. I don't make that mistake in people. I haven't to this day, and I thank God for that. I know the difference between those who want to argue about doctrine to get people not to follow the ways of Christ and those who fight about, fight about doctrine because it's a hope within them and they love their Messiah. See, I know the difference. I know people want to go see the Messiah quickly because all they see is anger and darkness in this world. It's totally understandable. Who wouldn't want to get out of this mess that people call life to go and be with the Messiah tomorrow? I totally get that one. I often fight for sobriety. That's all. Fight to keep people going. The Bible says a hope deferred makes the heart sick. I know what it is to want to leave to get out of something and to feel stuck. There's a way to combat that, but it requires a change of thinking so that a person is never, never, never depressed and upset again. And so I fight people in certain points of view. So they'll never set themselves up to be so upset, to hope for something so much, but there's still uncertain time in between. I would rather person focus in the moment, maximize this day. So I'll let everybody know the Messiah will come and get them, but he's ready to come and get them. And he will not fail in anything he promised. He will. But again, I know hope deferred makes the heart sick. That I know for sure. In fact, Many people know that now. Even some of the ones who argue different points, I know they've been so torn in the heart that something didn't happen, they don't ever want to discuss it again. I know that. And there again, we have a person that yearns for the Messiah. So they're not bad people. When you see those different causes, somebody has to be the voice of reason to encourage them to focus in this moment and to continue on. That's all it. Because I know for anybody who believes in the Messiah, he will bring them all the way home. And he will not fail. He already knows our mistakes, all that stuff. I already said that. He already knows that. So, be encouraged by that. Because this world is headed into an era that's going to become very unfamiliar. Yet, very familiar to most. In certain ways. We do live in a time where we'll see the celestial parts of our existence change. Geology is certainly changing. The weather phenomena will be brutal. Cities will fall. But every day, I'll tell you something. How do I get through my days seeing so much distress, damage, death, and everything else? You want to know my secret recipe? It's never failed. It overwhelmed me one time. Back in the past, I was overwhelmed by what I saw. The Lord showed me a way through all of it. I've stayed that way ever since. I used to see the world as a believer one way. But the Lord showed me a way to see the world in truth. That will never bring depression. 
never brings that sadness and heaviness. All that's gone. You want to know that formula? That's a real formula. Very productive formula. Instead of viewing everything and saying, oh, look how terrible everything is. And then when you look at your own life and you begin to do inventory and say, look at how many things went wrong. Do something very simple. See, because of this, this day right here, right? There are things that personally affected me during this hurricane, and by way of the organization did the same. But look how many things it did not affect. Look at the good that came. See, because in every disaster, you can be thankful. The Lord reminds me that a situation, any situation can be a thousand times worse than what it is. So, just like people, every day a person has not backstabbed me. I can celebrate that person, that they did not backstab me. I never look at a person grumpy like, I know one day that person's going to backstab me. Nope, I don't look at people like that. I'm very thankful this day they did not backstab me. And when the day comes when they do backstab me, I'll say, well, this is that day. I knew it was coming. And this day too will pass. And it messes with other people when you say, listen, we're all in the flesh. We're all prone to do anything. But just know I'm not holding anything against you. When you get back on your feet, let's go again. Let's get this thing right. Do you know how much hope that sows in a person? And it does something else. It fights off devils that would influence another person. The devil is always going to work through a person to get you to engage outside of righteousness or in a phony type righteousness. When you don't do that, he stopped using people that way. When you're ready to forgive for real, you already know they're going to backstab you. But every day they don't, you're thankful they didn't. Right? So when the day comes when they do, you say, well, I knew this was coming. So let's, you know, get over that, get back on your feet, and we'll go from there. Whatever devil was using that person, because you instantly forgave in truth, it starts running away. It runs. I mean, the think of the worst backstabbing you could ever have. If you were to go to the person and say, well, I knew that was coming. The reason why is because we're all dwelling in the flesh. I know where you're coming from. I probably would have done the same thing. And you get over that you're forgiving the individual. Of course, that devil in them will try a couple more times. You can just forgive it a couple more times. I mean, genuinely. Now, you're not going through motions. You actually forgive them. The devil departs from that person. In every single case, that person says, I don't understand what happened. I don't know what made me do that. They do it every single time. It's almost like they have no memory of what fully took place. Now, how can that happen every single day? I mean, every single time. That's when you really learn that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. But we truly are in a battle against principalities and powers. Spiritual wickedness. In a bunch of places. That's when you really start to learn that. You start to see that. Because the person, when, when that influence is gone, the person cannot remember everything. It's like having an argument, and it was a bitter argument. But then, when forgiveness enters in, the person cannot remember saying some of the things that you said they said. I don't remember saying that. That's what they'll say. So, then again, be thankful for every day a person does not backstab you. And always realize that anybody who is in the flesh can backstab you. Because they're in the flesh. Any person in the flesh is prone to things of the flesh. So be thankful every day they did not backstab you. Be thankful for those things that are working. I'm convinced if I did not, if the Lord had showed me those things, I would have had a, one of those severe mental breakdowns years ago. It would be very difficult for a person to walk in my shoes. You know how they give you Murphy's Law and they say everything that can go wrong will go wrong? Mm. If Murphy's Law is real, then if you think about Murphy's Law, then that's just a minimal piece. Yet I never complain. Because in my heart, I'm very thankful for those things that still are not broken. That didn't fall apart. That didn't backstab. And there's a lot to be thankful for in essence. I never count my losses. But I always count my blessings. The average unhappy person counts their losses. They have forgotten about their blessings. I don't need to count losses because it's a known fact that all of us are going to have those. I don't, I'm not in the habit of counting something 
that everybody is going to have in the first place. I do count my blessings, but losses, I'm always going to have those things. It's the one thing the Lord promised that we would always have in life. It is part of this process, so why count them? That's almost like a person told me one time. They said, you, you know, we got to we gotta show people where the devil is. I said, well, wait a minute, because you'd be pointing everywhere. Why call the devil out for being evil when he's supposed to be evil? Why do we get shocked when someone who is not covered by the blood of the Lamb does something wrong? Why do we get shocked when a human being does something wrong? They're of the flesh. Since you already know that's going to happen, don't look for it. Don't look for things that are right there all the time. Because all you're going to do is upset yourself every single day. If you start pointing out the evil all around you, you're going to be occupied all day pointing out the evil. Pointing out the negative. Pointing out the failures. That stuff is always going to be around you. Instead, start pointing out the righteousness. Instead of looking at a person and say, that person is kaput, look for that small light within them. And thank God they still have that small light. And if, if, if you're able, ask the Lord, can you assist? Can you assist in bringing that small light forward to him? He may let you, he may not. But ask. And remember, never impress anything upon anybody. But always be very gentle, very thoughtful. Always ask to help a person, to assist person remember we're not lords of anybody we're not we can assist we cannot make if a person does not want you cannot make them do anything you can only assist those who say yes so in that respect remain in that mindset you'll find all the scriptures come alive with great prosperity if you do that it's where your angels do isn't that what angels do Angels were never dispatched to people that didn't want them there. Angels were dispatched to people that asked for assistance, correct? Jesus did not go to anybody who rejected him. Jesus went to recipients who were asking for him. And when it came to people he did not know, remember the the, the, um, uh, centurion asked that he come to his house. But ironically, when Jesus went to his own hometown, they said, well, aren't you the carpenter's son, this, that, and the other? And it was written that he could do very little in that place why because nobody could see him as messiah they could only see him as the carpenter's son and they did not ask for his assistance in spiritual things so he couldn't do much because they never did ask they never did desire so gentlemen be gentlemen ladies be ladies always ask you'd be surprised how many people would say yes you'd be surprised And for everyone that does not want your help, there are about 10 other people that could use it. If you know about helping people, then you know it takes you some time to get charged up before you go out there and help people, right? So numbers, high numbers is not it. It's the quality of the one person. It's the departing of yourself and the Holy Ghost and somebody else in true servitude, not fake servitude. If anything is ever fake, don't do it at all. If you do not love it, don't do it. Where you do all things with compassion, you'll sow seeds of mercy and compassion. And when everybody else's structure is crushed, yours won't be. That happened to to COT. That was quite ironic. The waters, yes, we always get the waters. But nothing else. Lord is merciful. That means much to do. They're softening the ground in Beirut, which is the beginning of a limited ground operation. So it was proposed. But they are going through the motions of uh, airstrikes and mortars. And they do have a few tank battalions on standby. And some other things are happening too. So it implies they're going through on foot uh, to engage and to sweep areas. But I need to remind you guys that the outcome and the biblical nature of events will happen. It, it will take place. You know, sometimes in this chaotic type of environment the only truth we do have or direction we do have is that of the biblical kind I know there are many interpretations out there but essentially we know that at some point all the armies are going to be against Israel whether directly or indirectly we know that will happen we know that a confederate 
a group of nations who have indignation against the Holy Covenant will eventually set up the abomination of desolation. And at that time, whoever's in Judea is going to have to get out, flee to the mountains. We know at that time we're in the last hours. I know people talk about the tribulation timeline, things of that nature. My whole life has been turbulent, so I don't really, you know, I know about the three and a half years. I know about the time of the beast, the two witnesses. We know that essentially the whole world is going to see Jerusalem in exile again. We know that. But this time, instead of the United Nations bringing them back, it'll be the Lord himself that we know. We also know a thousand years of peace is coming. And for those who passed away, the Bible says, those who were beheaded, it says, in fact, those who were killed, and they still kept the faith, they were killed for very specific cause. Those who taken up with the Lord, they're going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. When Satan is bound a thousand years, there'll be peace on earth during that time. We know that. The time we live in right now is that decision period. Here's what I want to discuss. Why hasn't the end times happened yet? God has already told us. He said, it is written that God is not slack concerning his promises as men count slackness. That means based on our timeline, as we count calendars and calculate any and every calculation we could ever do will likely be inaccurate. I say that because God is not slack concerning his promises as men count slackness, but he's long suffering to us. meaning that he will lengthen the time based upon his heart towards humanity and based upon humanity's compliance to his call. He will lengthen or shorten the time based on that. The end times could have come 100, 200, 500,000 years ago. But the course of events will slow down or speed up and it's based on the salvation of us. For example, like some of you, you really love the Lord. You're learning. There are some things you have not gotten right yet that may be a prerequisite for your entry into the kingdom and your father is not willing to shut down the whole thing if you're not ready if the lord were to come back right now to get his people possibly many may not go because of specific things now, do you really think he wants any of his children who and not one of his children who loves him who agrees with this word who believes in him is going to perish outside of salvation they're not so he will lengthen the days, and he has, for our sakes. That's what I want you to know. But something is happening, something I've never seen before. I remember a time when people had an enthusiasm with the Word and with Christ. Many were coming to Christ, and many would have a change of heart. I remember that. Okay? I remember specifically the change of heart. I remember the internal it was almost like an internal guarantee that I would wake up tomorrow. I can't explain it, but that's just the way it was. I would tell people, listen, tomorrow I'm going to do so and so. They said, well, you don't know if you're going to have tomorrow. I said, yeah, I'm going to have tomorrow. There was an overwhelming sense that I would be here the next day. 2015, all of that stopped. Around the year 2015, there was no guarantee on the next day. And what I mean by that is that was the year when the uncertainty started. That was the real year when I would wake up and I, I, I could not tell anybody if I would be here tomorrow. I couldn't say that with any type of assurance. There was a time when I could say that with all assurance. Somehow, I just knew in 2015, it was like it ended. It was like it ended. There is no guarantee, no assurance. And you know what? Most of the saints... When they wake up each day, they are aware that something is about to take place and they start looking for what it is. That started in 2015 heavily. People began to go on the internet and search for things specific because something is telling them that there's no guarantee on tomorrow. Something is telling us there's no guarantee for tomorrow. Tomorrow may not be anything like this day. And it reflects within those who believe because they always wake up. They start looking at the news 
or some news feed to see what in the world is happening. In fact, if a person is away from a news feed or news site or something like that, it's almost like you dread, you, you, you have to see what's happening. You, you're, because you say to yourself, is this the moment? Well, those feelings, now something else has crept in. It has. See, people have been looking for some type of reassurance. Messages, I've noticed many messages, many speeches are about how we can get things better again. Listen to me. And I'm not referring, this is not a direct reflection on any one person making any one statement. But all of us used to say, hey, we, we can make our homes better again. We can make, you know, my life, I can, I can work on my life and get it better. And, and, but now, if you were to ever try to focus upon your home and your life and say, well, okay, in five years, I want this to happen or that, you can't do it anymore because it's almost like you're wasting your time. It is almost like you're wasting your time trying to make something better that's not going to be there. It's very difficult to explain, but there are no promises in that. Some of you, before you go and get a, uh, you're thinking about going into a certain avenue of a career, and then you ask yourself, is this a waste of time? And you don't know. Now, it's not a coincidence this is laid upon the hearts of believers. That's not a coincidence. That's a spiritual warning. That's when the Father determines a time has come. And now you begin to see those men and women of the world who are stuck in pride. Now, within yourselves, you can see that they're stuck and you're saying to yourself, I wish they wouldn't do that. It's almost like they cannot hear anything anymore. Anybody notice what I'm saying? Anything you pick up when you're a believer in Christ, you desire that others pick up is almost like they cannot hear you anymore. They can't even comprehend what you're saying anymore. In other words, I'm telling you, there's something is, is being cut off. And I've never seen it like this. Something is being cut off. It's almost like people are losing their ability to hear things associated with Jesus Christ anymore. It's even happening inside the church. I've never seen this before. But this lets me know, just like Somebody mentioned 2012, they believe everything changed. You better believe it changed. You better believe it. In 2015, for example, this is weird, but that's when most people who were having these extraordinary uh, visitations, they all left. It was like they all left. And if you guys take note from 2015, there was almost a, a hyper evacuation of Earth, meaning that a lot of people passed an entire generation started leaving the rest of that older generation left in 2015-2020. I mean, all of them were gone. The old generation, gone. Now, when you start thinking about the future too much, there's trepidation, great uncertainty, lots of confusion. This is that time we live in. This time is always marked now that we're beginning to witness a change in believers, there's a change in believers. How many of you have desperately looked at other believers and said, please don't give in to that to, to stuff external, the body of Christ? But how many of you, you know what that struggle is. It's almost like something in the world is calling you strongly. It is very seductive. It, it's luring. And if you're not careful, you're going to find yourself back into worldly activities very quickly. It's almost like something is speaking to your mind saying, what's the use? Why not come back? There is a spiritual battle that you can't see that's happening all around you. I mean, a, 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 a broad spiritual battle. And it also lets me know that a time of judgment is most definitely coming. So you have begun to see the earth react in relation to mankind's direction it wants to take by way of its majority. The earth has been changing strange ways. All of us can admit that some of the storms and some of the things that we have had have not exactly been normal. What you may not know is that um, physically things are changing. The weight of things are changing. Do, do you guys know that we had a we had a slight gravity change, and it never went back to normal. 
Now, with the gravity change, you may say, well, that's, you know, that can happen. Nobody would ever know. That's right. Nobody would ever know. The only way you would know is by way of swelling. See, if gravity ever becomes just a fraction too light, a fraction too heavy, your body's going to respond by way of its fluids and how it regulates internal and external pressure. Swelling is a consequence of that. And how many people have had aches and pains in their knees, their lower legs, their hips? It, it just so happens to be that you have swelling in the places where you have mobility. Not very good indicators. This time that we live in is no doubt it is going to be based upon mankind and his willingness his willingness to really have a need for Christ because I'll tell you right now if the need for Christ continues to dwindle I mean the need for Christ do you hear me the need for Christ it's one thing to profess Christ but who can profess the Lord and not need him to profess him is to say that he is king savior and Lord that is to also need him to need him is to seek him. To seek him is to conform to him. To conform to him is to be changed. To be changed is quite busy. There are more and more independent folks now who don't need him. Fight for their own causes. Listen, who are not afraid to openly utilize anything of him to put themselves first or forward never seen that before i've always seen a type of respect of the lord even among evil people they didn't come right out and say things against you know certain principles of the lord but nowadays they have no fear they have no fear nor shame of what they bring forward this lets me know that everything will change all of these close calls we had this year they're going to be direct hits in the years to come you know what the instruction was to the children, given a certain time, that the children hide themselves within the Lord. It was already promised that the earth would be utterly made empty, turned upside down. It's going to be shaken up. I think we're in that time. And based upon the next few weeks, based upon the influence of crowds and of people and everything else, it's going to dictate what will happen. It's going to dictate it. Because now there's no separation between human pride and devastations. As Christians, we can pay attention to those spiritual things and have spiritual principles. The world cannot see it. I believe it wise of us to begin to notice. Because something is coming. And things will change in this era. And I'll say it again. Can you imagine a hurricane just like the one that just passed? But in the dead of winter with snow and ice. Can you imagine a power outage for a month? Now based upon how man conducts himself and what people accept, so will we have. We're beginning to receive the very things we would deal upon anybody else. That's not coincidence. of their own selves, covetous, boasting, proud, blasphemous. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved if you're not willing to repent? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. 